Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Will Radio Part 15, Travel Writing Midori Canran Against Focus, November 3rd, 2024. It's been a long time since I made a video, uh, been a few months, and I had said that I thought I was going to be able to make more things, and I was going to focus much more on exactly what I was making and uh, you know, kind of where I put my attention. Obviously, I haven't made a whole bunch of videos since then. But I do think that I'm going to have some space to make more more videos. I've been missing making videos, and uh, you know the holidays are coming up, which makes it easier and harder to make videos in some sense. But it does seem like I at least have a few days a week now where I can make videos, and getting used to that. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, that's one reason I wanted to make this video. I've been thinking about it for a while. Just wanted to go ahead and start doing it because I notice when I make more videos, I make more videos. And actually, this is a re recording. I got a few minutes into this one and I was stumbling all over my words. And so that's, uh, you know, that was the original point of trying to make a bunch of videos was to not make a big effort every time I want to make a video. Just go ahead and sit down and do it. But I'm a little out of practice. So, uh, when I get back into practice, so I remember things like, what are the settings again when I process the audio? And, you know, what's the workflow again for uploading things to YouTube? Um, I don't think I'm so far out of it, but, you know, when I was trying to do three videos a day, certainly I didn't have any trouble remembering those things. Um, anyway, so I think I'll be able to make more videos, and I, I, I do miss it. Uh, I've been traveling. I was in Spain for Lambda World. Gave a talk called the An Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun, my favorite title. Actually, my mom got me a baseball cap. It's right in front of me that says An Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun. Um, very kind of her. So I got to go to Cadiz, Spain, C-A-D-I-Z. It's on the southern coast on the Atlantic, a little bit west of Gibraltar. Uh, it's like a little peninsula island type thing, I guess separated from the mainland by a causeway. I don't I don't know if it's a technically a peninsula or if it's really an island. Um, it's known now as being a pretty touristy place. There were a lot of people there from England, I think, who were vacationing. It was very warm. This is beginning of October. It was t-shirts and shorts weather um you know very quaint uh <clears throat> lots of little alleyways lots of bars and cafes and restaurants lots of people out at night lots of late dinners and that was that was fun it was fun visiting fun seeing friends um lambda world was was fun i think they're just recovering after covid you know, seems like they had gotten pretty big, like 600 people or something. And, uh, you know, now they're sort of having to start over again to some extent after COVID kind of shut everything down for a few years. I think this is the first Lambda World since COVID, if I understand correctly. That was fun. Um, I actually spent most of my time in Spain in my hotel room uh, hacking on Mini Canron. And so that's one of the things that I tend to do is try to use uh, these trips to think really intensely for an extended period of time about something I want to hack on and try to use that as the basis for a talk. And sometimes that pays off um, and, and I give an interesting talk showing something new. And sometimes I don't give such a great talk, but maybe I make progress on the problem and Sometimes, uh, you know, I don't make progress and I don't give a good talk, or sometimes I don't make progress on what I want to work on, but maybe I give a good talk. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, I try to use these trips as a way to um, further the research. And, you know, uh, for me, it's exciting to show something hot off the press. Like, you know, here's something I was hacking like two hours ago. Uh, let me show it to you. Or uh, 10 minutes ago, uh, I was trying to implement this one feature before the talk. Occasionally, I will implement a feature during the talk, but that, that gets a little riskier. Um, yeah, so I, I did spend most of my 
my time in my hotel room and made a lot of progress. Um, I was playing around with ideas I've been thinking about for years, actually uh, well before COVID happened. And finally, I took the time to to try to push it much further. And actually, the ideas I had kind of shifted over time the more I was thinking about it for, for this talk. So the talks, to me, are a great forcing function. International travel, great forcing function. I think partly because, okay, I'm in a hotel. My schedule's disrupted. My sleep schedule's disruptive. You know, people at work know that um, I'm not going to have a standard schedule. I'm in a hotel room. You know, I can think a lot and hack and and so forth and you know i just try to use that um you know instead of saying hey i'm jet lagged and uh how do do i find my way (laughs) around the city which is maybe how i used to think about things i think okay great you know let me try really hard to to make progress on some problem that i've been thinking about Um, So I worked on this, what I'm calling Midori Kanrin, Midori meaning green in Japanese. Uh, Kanrin or Kanrin is Japanese for relation. Um, So green relation, literally. Uh, The reason there's a color is um, taking inspiration from all the work on these languages and systems for doing uh, metaprogramming, reflective towers like black and blonde and um, brown and pink and purple turquoise maybe at some point Uh, so this is you know hopefully at some point will turn into reflective towers and collapsing towers Uh, has that kind of feeling to it but the basic idea is i had been thinking about combining different types of relational interpreters and sharing logic variables within a single query between different relational interpreters and uh, i was going to do something with that for my talk. But at some point I realized, well, you know, there, there's actually an interesting version of that, which is, at least I think it's interesting, which is that, you know, we, we spent for years, a lot of time trying to write these interpreters for a subset of scheme or racket in mini Canon as pure relations. Okay. So the Quine's example from the 2012, um, scheme workshop paper, or the 2017 ICFP Pearl, we show all these examples where we're doing interesting things with with uh, scheme programs or racket programs um, in an interpreter written as a relation. And more recently, <clears throat> we've made progress, we being sort of the mini kenrin community, a bunch of different people uh, working on different aspects of this, on doing mini kenrin mini kenrin um, there, there have actually been quite a few attempts. I've done attempts, Michael Ballantyne, Jason Heeman, and Dan Friedman. I don't know if Greg Rosenblatt's done one. I, th- I want to say yes, but I'm not sure. Um, but, but anyway, uh, Baroth Joshi um, and was working with me more recently, and we've done a lot of, of work. And Baroth did almost all the implementation, and I was trying to guide him some. Um, on trying to do what what we were calling meta Canron, which is mini Canron and mini Canron. So write a uh, mini Canron implementation as a pure relation in the same way that we have a scheme or min, uh, racket, you know, mini scheme or mini racket written as a pure relation. So that's meta Canron. Um, and so that's pretty cool. It's, it's much harder to do a significant interpreter for mini Canron it's just a lot more work, a lot more moving parts than for a subset of scheme because you have to implement search and unification, reification, all those parts of mini Canron. Plus you need still to handle lexical variables and environments, environment lookup, all that sort of thing. So it's just a lot more mechanism. So we had meta Canron, uh, mini Canron, mini Canron. We had of course the old scheme or racket and mini Canron. And just if you look at something like Metacanron or all of these implementations people have played with of a mini Canron, mini Canron, you'll notice, of course, that you know, for, for equal equal, for calls to equal equal, which is our unification operator in mini Canron, there are two expressions um, that, you know, like, like you write 
equal, you know, left paren equal equal e1, e2, right paren. And those expressions have to evaluate to terms, which are either values and scheme or, you know, logic variables, basically. Um, and those are the terms that you actually unify in the current substitution or the current constraint store. So um, that E1 and E2, those, those expressions are expressions in a language. What language are they? Some subset of scheme generally. So you might have cons, you might have quote, um, you, you might have symbols, you know, you might be able to quote symbols or you might have calls to cons and numbers, that kind of thing, numbers and Booleans. So we have a tiny mini language for these expressions. Um, that evaluate to terms that you can unify. And I was thinking, well, why aren't, why aren't we really combining these? Like, why aren't we making that expression language all of our mini scheme or, or mini racket? Like, why, why do you have to use this wimpy language which just has cons? Now, I think the long, longer answer is, well, because it's really hard just to do a mini canner mini canner to begin with, and only relatively recently do I think we have implementations that kind of worked well enough to to really play around with or at least that I understood well enough to play around with um, and so that was part of it and you know metacanron's quite slow um, you usually have to use some pretty advanced tricks to try to make something like a metacanron faster um, but in any case I thought well it'd be fun you know forget performance let's just extend that language for those terms, uh, you know, sorry, the, exp the, the expressions that we're allowed to unify. Well, expand that so that we can put arbitrary scheme or racket or mini scheme, mini racket expressions in those positions. Like, okay, if you can have cons, well, why can't you have list? Why can't you call append? You know, why can't you make arbitrary function calls to scheme functions? Uh, and then Going beyond that, if you read the first edition of the Reason Schemer, you'll see that we play quite a few tricks where we mix scheme code and mini Kenrin code. In the second edition of the Reason Schemer, we don't do that. It's much more sort of hermetically sealed. We have, instead of define and lambda to define uh, <clears throat> relations, we use this defrel form. But in the first edition, it is very scheme scheme uh, centric and you could mix and match scheme. And so you could put let racks and lets anywhere you wanted to. You could, you know, stick a, a bunch of relations and list and, you know, iterate over them in different ways. You know, you could play all sorts of games. So I wanted a language or a, a version of, of a, a relational interpreter where you could play those sorts of games where you could, um, you know, let bind a scheme lexical variable to, uh, a, you know, uh, some function that represents a relation and then use that variable in ver you know, other places or, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you should be able to mix and match scheme and mini Kenrin code arbitrarily within this interpreter that's written as a relation, mini Kenrin relation. So that's what Midori Kenrin's about. Uh, so I hacked up uh, first a simple version that was based on um, Meta Kenrin. I sort of extended it and cleaned it up some and then added a little bit of handling of scheme. And that one, which is what I showed in my talk in Spain, I had uh, separate let recs for relations and for scheme functions. You know, it's not, not super clean, but I got it working well enough that I could kind of play with the idea and show it off a little bit. And then um, I had some more travel. I visited Jason Heeman at Seton Hall, um, gave a, a, a talk there and a a guest lecture, and that was also a lot of fun. But we, um, uh, you know, during during the train trip, I took the train down to Seton Hall, which is in you know, South Orange, uh, New Jersey, near uh, Newark, New Jersey, which is right across from Manhattan. Um, so anyway, it's like New York, New Jersey um, boundary area. Uh, on the train down there, which took like four and a half hours or something, I hacked up another Midori Canron, which was based instead on a relational scheme interpreter, which is the faster hyphen, or sorry, full hyphen interp um, interpreter in faster mini Canron. 
um, the Faster Mini Canon repo and Michael Ballantyne's GitHub. Um, so starting from a scheme interpreter, and then basically I just pasted in the code from Micro Canron, um, and then you know said, okay, let's just interpret since we already have a scheme interpreter. Uh, I just massaged the Micro Canron code a little bit to work with that subset of scheme, uh, and then things like run, run, run in, run star, um, fresh, condi, which are special forms. I just added those to the interpreter, um, and then I, I did a pretty tight embedding uh, or an integration of Scheme and Mini Canon. And that was great because I could try all sorts of examples. It was very slow because of the way um, the, there were so many levels of interpretation happening. Uh, so much of it had to call out to, you know, do micro and evaluation. Maybe staged evaluation would make that fast. I don't know, but it was super slow. It was, I tried um, a pendo in, in the micro canron. And then I tried it, you know, micro canron extended with like Condi and Fresh and Run, Run Star. Uh, I tried that in just regular mini canron using faster mini canron and also in uh, the. Uh, Midori can run use build on top of of uh, micro can run. There's so many levels going on. <laughs> I'm having trouble talking. Oh, there's so many levels. Anyway, uh, it was a hundred thousand times slower to do a simple append of you know couple of length five. You know, uh, a list of length three and a list of length two, just move going for in the forward direction. It was a hundred thousand times slower than mini Canron. Okay. Not a hundred thousand times slower than, than chase scheme, a hundred thousand times slower than just mini Canron. Um, so it was pretty slow. Uh, but anyway, now I'm hacking on a third version of mini Canron. Oh, uh, sorry. Midori Canron that should have the tight integration between scheme and mini Canron. Um, but uh, should be faster. So, um, yeah, I'm part of the way down there. And I, I actually, I'm supposed to give a, a talk, um, at the programming languages course at Harvard on Tuesday. Hopefully, hopefully we'll show that off. So, you know, that's nice having these little, you know, these multiple deadlines, you know, I'll move that up here. Um, that's been something I've been trying to take advantage of is, uh, also I gave a talk, or gave a presentation at the monthly Mini Canron Research Seminar, which is online, um, also on Midori Canron. So I'm just trying to give lots of, of little talks and presentations um, with about Midori Canron to encourage me to keep uh, improving it and to talk to people and get ideas. Because remember, if you know the history of Mini Canron, you know, the idea of doing quines came from Stu Holloway when Dan Friedman and I gave a, a talk at the second, I think, Closure Conj in New York. I mean, um, uh, North Carolina. Uh, we gave an untalk. Um, so Stu suggested, hey, or observed, you should be able to do quines. And that led to lots of interesting work. Um, you know, same with a pen. You know, that was Michael Ballantyne's observation. And, you know, on and on and you know, uh, various people have pointed out interesting programs we could write. So that's, I, I consider it a critical thing is if we have anything new in, in Mini Canron, just to show it to lots of people and get their response and their thoughts and suggestions. So um, Dmitry Buchalov had a, a really good uh, suggestion that maybe Midori Canron, or maybe you could just do this in, in straight Meta Canron. Uh, maybe you could use... Uh, Midori Canron to implement like quanti quantification, like universal quantification, or I was thinking maybe implication when he's, once he said that, like in Lambda prologue and actually the Midori Canron part might help because you have Lambda and Midori Canron. So that's the big difference, or that's one of the big differences. Um, as soon as you can mix and match scheme, now you have, now you have Lambda. Um, it's not the only difference, but but that is a difference. So maybe that's, maybe that's useful. Maybe you can do kind of Lambda prologue type things. Um, I don't know. The, the other thing I'm interested in with Midori Canron is the idea that 
just like when we uh, run scheme code in the relational interpreter, we can take scheme append a function and treat it as a relation and do synthesis um, of arguments like as a relation, just like appendo. We could treat append as a function like appendo the relation. So um, I've, I'm hoping that it's the case that we can take extra logical, non-logical operators, whatever you want to call it, from either mini Canron or Prolog or whatever. So in mini Canron, we have conde, conju, project, um, once. And in Prolog, there's a certain retract and cut, uh, you know, copy term, all these things that are, are non-logical. That they're not, it's not really clear what they mean logically or probably they don't mean anything logically. And so uh, they seem to inhibit relational programming as far as I can tell. But I'm hoping that by writing um, you know, nice interpreters for those languages as pure relations in Mini Canron, that we'll be able to do useful forms of synthesis and reasoning with these extra logical or non-logical operators that are still logically sound in a sense because we're going through the relational um, interpretation. Uh, similarly to how we can deal with not or negation. Uh, Mini Cameron doesn't have not, doesn't have negation. Um, it has very weak types of negation like disequality, but doesn't really have a, a full negation. Certainly doesn't have a negation on relations, but because we have scheme, a scheme interpreter, we can get schemes not and use not to represent um, negative information in a way. So. Anyway, I, I feel like there's something there uh, that's worth exploring. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm, I'm excited about the Midori Canron stuff. It seems like uh, it's a real challenge uh, <clears throat> to get it performant. And the, the programs that you can write in it are quite interesting. Um, yeah. And now I want to have like a mini, a mini prologue with... So, excuse me, a certain retract and uh, prolog style meta interpreters and all those sorts of things <clears throat> inside of uh, Mini Canron. Yeah, just curious about that. Uh, speaking about travel, so when I was in New York, or sorry, New Jersey, I also went to <clears throat> Manhattan and I visited a friend. Uh, we went to a restaurant in Greenwich Village and had a you know, fun, fun dinner, but, um, visiting Manhattan, that's the first time I visited Manhattan since, or New York at all, um, since COVID and it reminded me a little bit of visiting Tokyo last March, uh, March, 2023, which was when Tokyo was first opening up. Now I know New York's been open for a while, but when I visited Akihabara, Tokyo, a lot of my favorite places were, had just like shut down. And the family restaurants, which were open 24 hours, like the Denny's, you know, closed at like 10 p.m. or something. The whole nightlife was shut down. The uh, Sega, the giant twin Sega, you know, multi-story arcades. They were like six or, six or eight stories tall. I don't even know how tall they were. They're giant. Uh, had shut down, you know, so it was... Um, you know, it felt, felt like kind of I had been beaten up by COVID and uh, Tokyo had been beaten up by COVID and New York felt a little like that. And maybe I was projecting, but, you know, it's there on a Saturday night and it just didn't seem maybe as busy. And then I, I, I said to my friend, huh, you know, I guess uh, I've got a little time. I could try going to see some jazz at the blue note or something like that. But, oh yeah, it's a Saturday night that I'll never get in. And he said, oh yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to get in. Uh, jazz is dying in New York. Um, they're, they're trying to find people to go in. And now I think to uh, COVID has accelerated a lot of other trends and, you know, I don't, I don't know how dead uh, jazz is in New York city right now, but you know, certainly well before COVID when I'd visit, uh, it seemed fairly alive, but who knows? Maybe, maybe these are, are macro trend, trends that are taking a long time, and um, maybe jazz is either just on the way down or moving to uh, other areas of the U.S. and around the world. I'm not sure, but 
I, I was sort of surprised to hear that. So curious what other people's experience are. Um, let's see. So I've been trying to get into writing. You know, this is something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe I should change that number. That's not a number. I've uh, been trying to get into to writing more. <clears throat> this is you know, sort of a theme on this channel, theme in my life. Um, you know, I've uh, been watching a lot of videos, uh, interviews with um, Ray Bradbury and been reading lots of books by classic sci-fi authors. You know, may maybe too much, probably. I've been cop trying to copy too much off what what they say or do. Uh, Ray Br Bradbury was saying something like, write a thousand words a day. I forget the exact amount, a thousand words or 1500 words a day, every day for a year or, or would no, uh, maybe it's three years. Uh, and then you'll be a writer. It's something like that, right? It's like write a thousand words a day for three years every day and you'll be a writer. I don't know. Change, change the exact numbers a little bit. I don't remember if it was a year or or three years, but his point was if you write every day and you meet a certain word count every day and you can do that consistently, um, you know, you're a writer. You may not be a great writer, but but at that point you're a writer. So I, I tried an experiment. Uh, I call it my plain writing experiment. And I, I was trying, uh, you know, okay, how do I write 1500 words a day or a thousand or 2000? Um, and what I found was the thing that worked best was to just write on paper. So I had a, a notebook, just wrote it in pen, and then I thought, okay, well, how in the world do I get this into my computer? So I was using the Whisper tool uh, from OpenAI, and you can run it locally, you know, so it doesn't phone home, I don't think. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it does phone home, but you certainly you can run it locally, and I think you can run it without the internet or anything like that. Um, and I was just doing doing transcription, so I would just read aloud what I was saying. And you know, the the modern voice transcription is is good enough that with very light amount of editing, I was able to um, you know get that into my computer. And I was you know writing you know, reading what I'd written didn't take that long. And it also gave me another chance to kind of change things on the fly. I was, as I was doing dictation. Um, so that seemed to work pretty well. And it, it saved my wrists as far as typing goes. Um, you know, I didn't have too much trouble writing, but I have had trouble when I'm typing a lot. So, okay, I could do that. And I did that for a few days straight and I did it trying to work on a book. Uh, you know, as you know, probably I've tried writing a lot of books. Um, and so that was a book uh, sort of like mentoring advice and that kind of thing. Things I've learned about academia, all that sort of thing. So I, I wrote a, I don't know, on the order of a week every day doing that. Um, and it's like, okay, well, I could do this. I could do this. Um, I probably couldn't do it every day or it'd be difficult every day because I don't really do anything every day really um, especially if I'm traveling to Spain uh, to give a talk and I'm hacking really intensely probably not going to write 1500 words a day but I was able to write I think 3000 words one day um, and you know a thousand words wasn't too hard and it's like okay I could do it it seemed easier for me to write on paper than to type in any case, it seemed, seemed like something I could do, um, but I didn't really stick with it. So, you know, it was a little experiment. I could do it. Uh, I think at some level, I wasn't that into the book. Um, I think that's that type of book, an advice book, I'm always wary of because it's so easy to give advice that it's not helpful to people. Um or you know they'll they'll take it out of context or or whatever. So um, yeah, I worked on it some. Maybe I'll go back to it. Maybe not. Uh, but that was an experiment I tried. I've got some other writing stuff I'll tell you about later. But that was one of the things I did um, about the time I went to Spain. And of course, I've been hacking on improving Midori Canron quite a bit on and off. Uh, one of these. 
Okay, so so speaking of writing, one of these books that I've been reading is a, a doc. Uh, sorry, a biography of Harlan Ellison called A Lit Fuse, and it's right here. It's by who is this? It's the second edition, I think. Expanded second edition by Nat Segaloff. Um, and it's quite an interesting book. Harlan Ellison is this famous, famously cantankerous and talented writer. Uh, been reading some of his his sci-fi. Um, I actually find it more interesting to read read about him sometimes than than to read his stories. But he he wrote wrote classic stories like uh, was it for Star Trek? He wrote an episode of Star the original Star Trek called City on the Edge of Forever, where he famously was upset with changes made to the script. Um, and also he wrote a a short story called uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, um, which, anyway, that, that he, he wrote a lot of very famous sci-fi, but he was also known as being um, someone with a very short fu- fuse that was already lit. Um, so it's an interesting book, and it also talks a lot about how he got into writing. So I've been reading these books about people getting into writing. Um, so that... It's been part of my attempt to try to inspire myself. I don't know if it helps, right? It's like, well, if you want to become, uh, if you want to learn physics, does it really help to read a uh, biography of Newton? Or is that more, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if that helps or not. If you read about Newton and Einstein, uh, maybe that just makes you depressed or, or, you know, maybe, maybe you're copying the wrong things. You know, what what is it about Newton and Einstein that's worth copying? Um, it's probably not Einstein's haircut. Uh, that's probably not the thing to copy off of Einstein if you are going to copy something. But in any case, uh, I was reading that book, and and a couple of days ago, I had a dream, a very vivid dream, and the dream was about writing writing this book that I'm trying to write, which is on relational interpreters. It's called Relational Interpreters and Mini Canron. That's the name of it. So that's that's the book I really want to write. Um, so that, yeah, I just had this very vivid dream and people were asking me about it and I was telling them about it. And then I woke up and I thought, well, you know, I haven't worked on this book. You know, I've got I, I poked around a tiny bit, but then I'd look at it and it's like, oh, I've got literally like three sentences I've written and a couple notes. And so it's like, okay, subconsciously, I really want to write, I really want to write this book. So, uh, and, and the Midori Canron stuff got me fired up about it. And also I think, um, you know, giving talks again, you know, so this is my first time, you know, so Lambda World was the first time I had traveled internationally to give a talk other than going to to give a tutorial um, in Tokyo for programming, which I gave a tutorial on, on uh, Mini Canron. However, you know, Japan was really just opening up at that time. And there were to, to say the tutorial wasn't well attended would be an understatement. Uh, I mean, who knows if it would have been a, would have been a, a you know well attended anyway? But um, it was it was not well attended anyway. That was a while ago. So so now um you know it feels like things are getting more back to where they were before, and so going to Spain and also um, going to Seton Hall and giving this programming languages. Uh, talk coming up and also a mini Canon tutorial. So that's like kind of four events in a relatively short period of time, all about this mini Canon uh, relational interpreter idea and pushing it further. So that's keeping me inspired. And, and I really do want to write this book on writing relational interpreters. And so I decided um, yesterday that I was going to spend the weekend trying to get unstuck how do we get unstuck? In fact, I was going to make a video and I thought, you know, well, I'll make a video. I'll make a will radio only if I feel like I've made some progress because otherwise, uh, you know, I want to spend the weekend just focusing on getting unstuck with the book. 
and and there's kind of a bigger question here. And it's not about it's not just about getting unstuck writing the book. It's also you know the the Midori Cameron stuff I'd been thinking about on and off for like five or six years, uh, probably like six years, some of those ideas. And, uh, you know, my question is, why does it take flying to Spain? Why, why do I have to fly across the Atlantic and give a talk at a conference and lock myself away in a hotel room for a week to make progress on, you know, on that thing I've been thinking about on and off for six years? Like, why is that the case? And how do I get unstuck not just for writing a book, but just making progress on Mini Canva. Now, sometimes it's like, well, these things take time. You have to develop new techniques, working with students, you know, getting papers out, um, talking about ideas. You know, I mean, there there is just like a certain pace at which things move. Um, and there's some of that, but I, I don't think that's really it. So that's another thing I was thinking about this weekend. And so I've got a couple ideas of, of how I can get unstuck. Like, you know, how do I replicate the experience of flying to Spain for a week and holding up in the, uh, um, hotel and staying up till 4 a.m. each night hacking? Well, I can't do that exactly. Okay. That's, I, I work full time and I'm on three government projects now, all this stuff. So it's, it's not like I can just take a week off and, and uh, work on something like that. However, um, I do think that after thinking about it more, there's some observations I have that um, I think can help me make make progress without having to you know fly to another continent. Um, so so one thing that I, I always knew this to some extent, but I think I think it's becoming more clear. Um, I'm I'm good at with paper. I'm good with paper and pen. There's something about writing on a computer or programming on a computer that immediacy is I think it sort of the opposite of abstraction for me. Um if I want to think abstractly, you know, sitting in front of a typewriter or a computer um or certainly like a REPL, that's not necessarily good. It's good for playing around, messing around. Um, but it, I don't think it's so good for like big level ideas and thinking about what I want to do long term and whatever. So I think, you know, just in addition to making time to think, um, making time for me to just work on paper. So yesterday um, I went out and I just had a little notebook and some pens and, you know, sat there and, and wrote for a few hours Um not in my apartment. Uh, and I think that was, that was helpful. I didn't have a computer, just had paper and pen. And then today I felt I'd thought about things enough and written enough notes where I could use uh, a laptop. So I did bring a laptop with me and make some prog- progress. But, but uh, anyway, working on paper helps, I think. Um, I'm good on a plane or a train or in a cafe or in a hotel room, you know, those sorts of spaces uh, where I don't have distractions. Um, I tried to simplify uh, my writing and this book on interpreters. You know, um, I've got a sense of humor and I enjoy indulging in the sense of humor and creativity. Uh, But I think in some sense that that can get in the way. So for this book, I just want, at least for a first draft, to make it very simple and straightforward. Um, I think it's just like an interesting, compelling topic. I don't have to be fancy about it. Just, you know, just be as clear as possible. Um, And as far as, you know, the writing of the book, there were all sorts of things I was trying in terms of, you know, fancy typesetting or, you know, having some sort of multimodal thing or having an online or whatever. And I said, okay, forget that. I'm going to go back to the the least distracting thing that I'm good at that I could show to people easily, which is just like plain LaTeX, the plain book style for LaTeX and keeping everything, you know, pretty much plain text. It's not quite Markdown because I actually don't like Markdown that much. I'd rather just, 
I'm just very, very used to doing like just very plain LaTeX stuff. So I kind of ripped out everything, threw away everything for that relational interpreter book and started writing it again. Um, just trying to be as simple as possible. And I think the simplifying seemed to help. Um, and then probably the, the biggest insight I had was just thinking about like, well, what do I do in Spain? Like when I was in that hotel room in Spain, what was I doing? Um, I was watching Starcraft, you know, it's like in bed, watching Starcraft, watching movies, and then, you know, thinking and maybe take like naps and, or, you know, put things to the side, just kind of close my eyes for a while thinking, writing down notes on paper and then, you know, like typing furiously and then, you know, uh, watching more StarCraft, um, that kind of thing. And uh, that's what I did yesterday. I was like, okay. I watched the um, SSL, which used to be ASL, um, which was the Afrika Star League, and now it's the Soup Star League, S-O-O-P. They rebranded, I don't know why. Um, so StarCraft 1, Korean StarCraft 1 uh, pro tournament, cast in English by Artosis and, and Tasteless. Um, so I enjoy that a lot. And so I would watch, uh, one of these, you know, pretty long videos, uh, YouTube videos. And, you know, between the games, I would, I would work. Um, the games sometimes can be pretty long. And what I found was by the time the game was done, I was ready to work. I was like, okay, I've got a whole bunch of ideas here. I want to, I want to get down or make progress on. Um, and then, you know, that was for writing. And then the, was it, this is maybe on Thursday or Friday. I think it's Thursday night. No, I mean, no, maybe it was Friday night. I was hacking on the Midori Canron and I had uh, one of my favorite movies, Big Trouble in Little China. I had that up in a little move, a uh, little window while I was uh, hacking. Um, you know, so that sort of thing, it's like something about that just feels cozy. It's like, all right, this is the sort of thing I would do on a Saturday night anyway, probably. It's like, have some pizza and then, you know, curl up in bed and watch some StarCraft. Uh, it's just, you know, my idea of nerd fun. Um, that reminds me of this uh, saying that, you know, the only difference between the arche archaeologists and a grave robber is that an archaeologist documents their finds, right? Um and I was thinking, you know, the, the, the only difference between Will writing a book or hacking on Midori Canron um, and a regular Saturday night for me is, um, you know, in between StarCraft games, I'm typing furiously. That, that's about the only difference. And I, I think that's, that's true. It's true if I'm writing a paper. It's true if I'm writing a grant proposal. These are things that... Uh, I think there is a combination of kind of like inherently stressful or something like that, where if I, if I uh, think about it too much, I can get, I can kind of stress myself out about it and I don't want to do it. But if I can hook, you know, uh, what I'm trying to, to do to something I just enjoy and I can, you know, I can watch Starcraft for, for all day. Like I have no problem watching Starcraft all day. So if I'm going to watch, you know, four hours or six hours of StarCraft and I can tie that time to uh, thinking about a book or thinking about hacking a mini canner and whatever it is, um, you know, I find that just kind of naturally I'll have all these little sessions where I'm thinking about explicitly about whatever my task is. And then subconsciously as I'm going along, you know, more and more, of the time I realized, oh, I didn't even pay attention to the last three minutes of that match because uh, I was thinking about, you know, this code I'm going to write so much. So let, me, let me rewind that and watch that again. And by the time there's a break, you know, I'm ready to, to start working. Um, and then at some point I might just like turn it off for a while. It's like, okay, I'm just going to hack for a while. But if I don't, that's fine because what I'm getting is a whole bunch of little sessions where I think about something, where, where I, I take some action, maybe I get stuck, or there's a question to answer, 
or how do I want to organize this? How are whatever it is, and I don't even really have to think about it explicitly. I can watch, you know, some Starcraft or watch a movie or something or an episode of Miami Vice, going back to the eighties, um, and uh, you know, it won't take very long before I have kind of a true intrusive thoughts of, hey, you know, uh, need to to pause this and and try to do some work. And in fact, you should make this change. And I, I try to ignore that, actually. I said, no, I'm going to watch this whole game. And by the time the game's over, I'm I'm really, like, chomping at the bit to do some work. Um, anyway, that is kind of what I actually do. Um, you know, sometimes I go to a coffee shop and work or whatever, and that, that can also work. But um, most of the time, I'm, I'm thinking deeply it doesn't look like it. It looks like I'm watching Starcraft or something. I mean, it, it, I don't know. It's like the the times I'm actually doing really deep work, if you want to think of it that way, it doesn't look like I'm doing deep work. It looks like I'm goofing around or taking a nap or something. So, um, you know, that's kind of the essence of it for me is like watching Starcraft and Big Trouble in Little China in bed. Um the only difference is I have Emacs open at the same time. Yeah. So I think, think there's something there to it. So, um, maybe, uh, maybe that's the key for me and try to, instead of trying to uh, see the typewriter as, um, as candy, as Ray Bradbury suggested, you know, I just, you know, for me, Starcraft is candy, uh, eighties movies are candy, stuff like that. So I can have, have all that candy and I just tie the candy to uh, to whatever's in my Emacs buffer, and I'll be okay. Um, and another thought I had today is, you know, if that's true, then uh, maybe I can also use that for some other things I've had trouble with, like making music. Um, you know, I've got this PolyIn Tracker Plus I have, and I've got a Dirty Wave M8, and I've got a Linstrument, and, you know, various synthesizers and an OP1. I've got all these gadgets that it's like, well, maybe um, maybe this gadget will be the, the one that gets me unblocked. But of course, you know, you watch the videos and the, they don't have the disclaimer that talent's not included. But I don't think it's so much about talent. I think it's, it's just like me, you know, playing around with... Um, mini Kenrin stuff or, or playing around with a book. It's like, uh, it's not, not about talent. It's about the fact that I, I'm just spending time doing it, you know, spending hours and hours and hours of time. And it accumulates over time, um, just playing around with it. So I, I don't see why making music would be any different. So maybe there's a way I can tie, you know, playing around with one of these gadgets, you know, this pro- probably works well if it fits in bed. Um, that's probably better. So I can sit there watching some Starcraft and, then, you know, playing around with the tracker or something. Um, the other thing of music is I was going to take some singing lessons, but, you know, sort of the same problem with making videos, which is sound. <laughs> I live in a space with other people uh, that, kind of reared his ugly head again and I would have had to to go find a place to sing and as soon as it's as soon as step one is you know rent out a place where I can be loud um, I just know myself well enough to have a pretty good sense that it's not going to happen very often um, if I have to do that so anyway maybe another time but the singing um, yeah I don't know singing would be cool uh, speaking of singing, there are uh, a couple things I'll share that I've enjoyed listening to a lot. So there's uh, a singer, who, um, an Indonesian singer, and her channel is Rainy CH. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. Is it Rainy or is it Rain? Is it Rain, Rain CH or Rainy CH? I think it's Rainy CH. Um, I think that's right. Anyway. She's an Indonesian singer, and she really loves uh, singing Japanese songs or singing songs in Japanese. And she's got some amazing covers of songs in English in Japanese. And so one is The Weeknd's, uh, 
uh, was it blinding lights or whatever in Japanese. And when you hear it, it's like, Oh, okay. That song must have originally been in Japanese. Right. Uh, and also, uh, Doja cats, uh, say so, um, same thing. And it's like, Oh, okay. There's something about her singing those in Japanese. They sound like, sound like those songs must have originally been in Japanese. So anyway, I'm enjoyed listening to those. And then there's a Shabayan record. Oh yeah. She has a, a collab with Shabayan records, which is my favorite music producer. Um, and so, uh, they've got a song, it's called disco light, um, that she sings. So that's, that's really cool. That's how I found out about her for, from Shabayan. Uh, Shabayan also has a song called R dot I dot N dot, which also I love. Um, and then from gaming, so I have I play this uh, text adventure roguelike game called Ang Band based on Yu Moria. I've been playing this game in some form or another since 1989. I've never won it. I've gotten very close to winning it. Uh, these days I crank up the difficulty uh, to a sort of absurd amounts. But the, that's like a gen- dungeon crawler type thing where everything is you know randomly generated. Uh, in the late eighties, I had this solo game called uh, chainsaw warrior that I bought. I think it was from games workshop, 1987 or something. That was a solo game. That was kind of interesting. And I was, I was interested to find that, um, uh, there is quite the solo, uh, role-playing uh, game genre these days and there are a number of youtube channels exploring that so there's a channel called man alone which i like um and you know so some of these solo role-playing games like they're they're you know you do journaling and you're coming up with backstories and all these sorts of things but then there's another approach which is more like this is much more like a dungeon crawler like ing band um and there's a system called 2D6, which is a print and play game. So I actually just got the the core version of it, which means you know paying some money to download a PDF and you print out a few things. Um, but it's all you know two six sided dice. You need a few more six sided dice than that. Um, but it's all randomized, and you have all these tables to you know, and then and, and you randomly generate the dungeon layout as you walk through it. So it's sort of like Ingban, except it's like an analog version where you have paper, paper and pencil. Um, yeah. So I've been learning how to, how to play that game. Um, no, uh, that's another thing I do, you know, to take a little break, I'll read a few pages of that, of that book, uh, the, uh, the 2d6 manual. All right. Well, those are a few of the things I've been, up to and um, I'm gonna go back to working on my book and hacking on Midori Canron um, and hopefully we'll make uh, make some more videos uh, shortly I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with videos I was really having fun with the R6 RS report uh, videos that was fun uh, I definitely want to do something on relational interpreters Midori Canron you know, so maybe I'll do a series, you know, maybe that ties into the book somehow. That's, you know, a lot of books start, a lot of academic books start from lecture notes. Um, I don't intend this really to be an academic book. I want it to have a wider audience than that. But um, that's something I could do is make videos talking about the relational interpreters and the techniques and all that. And maybe that helps tie into the book. And maybe I could, you know, have parts of the book as they come together I could, you know, point to that from videos. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure that out. But uh, still trying to figure out, like, what I want to make uh, videos about as I, as I have space and time to start making them again. And then, yeah, so I guess the against focus part, uh, I guess my point is that my last video, I was talking about how focus is going to try to be on a few things. And in some sense, that's not wrong because I am focusing on this one book on relational interpreters, uh, Midori Canrin, you know, so, so I, I am fairly focused in a way. Uh, I'm not trying to write 17 books at once, uh, that, that kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, 
I'm trying to, you know, take advantage of the fact that uh, just lounging in bed watching StarCraft uh, or Miami Vice, uh, that, that seems to be a superpower of mine, uh, as long as I can tie that to actually getting something done. So, you know, and try to try to take advantage of that natural tendency because if I think, okay, I'm going to work on a book for four hours or six hours or whatever, um, I may or may not end up doing that. But if it's like, I'm going to watch the StarCraft tournament, um, I'm going to watch this for three and a half hours. Like, yeah, that's probably going to happen actually. Uh, or, or I'll watch, uh, you know, Aliens again, or I'll watch a couple episodes of Miami Vice. Like, yeah. That, that's probably much more likely to happen. And if I just tie that to working on the book or Minnie Kenrin, then I think, I think, uh, that's what, that's how things happen around here. Yep. Okay. Well, I uh, hope you all are doing well and, um, hope to make some more videos soon. Thanks. Bye.